We'll talk more about hypothesis testing. We often talk about type 1 and type 2 errors, which are just about the most boring possible labels, but they're important. Statisticians and economists are just not really interesting people. Sorry. Uh, but, all right, since there are inevitably randomness in the outcome of a hypothesis test, this little table, table here might help. There are two possibilities in the row. Either we reject the null hypothesis or we do not reject the null hypothesis. Then the vertical columns, we have two possibilities. Either the null hypothesis is true or the null hypothesis is false. If the null hypothesis is true and we do not reject, that's a win. That's good news. Alternately, if the null hypothesis is false and we reject the null hypothesis, then again, win. But those off diagonals, oh poop, were screwed up. If the null hypothesis is true and we reject it accidentally, that's type one error. In our dice example that we did in class, the null hypothesis is that the dice are completely fair. And rejecting it would be a case of, you know, like my fair dice just happened to roll more sixes than I might have expected. And I say, oh, these are unfair dice, even though, you know, the, the poor things actually didn't do anything wrong. The other off diagonal is type two error, where the null hypothesis is in fact false, but I do not reject it, even though I should have. Back to the dice example, that would be the case where maybe I've shaved off one side so it's slightly different probability of rolling six, but maybe, you know, in only 20 rolls, I don't have good power. So I cannot reject the null hypothesis conclusively. I can't say for sure that it's not a fair dice. When we set up the hypothesis test, we can choose the level of significance. That's the probability of making a type one error. That's where the choice of like 5% comes from. We can control that part. We cannot control the probability of type two error because that depends on how close is the null hypothesis to being true. In our dice example, again, if I do just a little bit of shaving, maybe six is one percentage point more likely to come up, then it would take an awful lot of rolls to be able to recognize that. If I don't roll enough, if I don't get enough data, I might not reject the null hypothesis the dice is fair, even though that's an error. As in all of economics, there's a trade-off. The lower we drive down the probability of type one error, the higher, therefore, type two probability error becomes. Often our tests are comparing samples. We might ask, is there a difference in the means? Asking if two means are equal is the same as asking if, when I subtract one mean from the other, do I get zero? Of course, they'll never be precisely zero, but we want to know if the differences in means is big. How big would the difference have to be for us to say that's a big difference? To create that hypothesis test, we want to find the standard error of the difference in the means. With x bar one and x bar two representing the means of each group, standard errors S1 and S2, using the formulas about linear functions, show that as long as those are not correlated, as long as the outcomes, the two groups are indeed independent, then the standard error of the difference is going to be the square root of the sum of the variances, not the standard errors, divided by each n. Sometimes you see other formulas. I think in Hawks they go through some of those, that if we're willing to assume the standard errors are equal, then you could use a different formula. But that gives rise to the question, how do you know? Why would I think the means are different, but the standard errors are identical? It's kind of a strange or difficult assumption generally is more conservative to estimate each different standard error, then the tests are going to be a little more conservative, trading off between type 1 and type 2 error. Another thing that you commonly see in principles is you're shown how to construct a one-sided test. Instead of saying, what is the probability I could see a measure as big as x, where big is an absolute value, we ask the easier question, what's the probability that I could see a measure as big in one direction, only one direction? In those little pictures, that's the light purple shading, not the dark purple shading. Now I'm not adding both tails, instead only using one of the tails. And the total shaded area is lower in the bottom picture with the light purple. A one-sided test is not as rigorous. While it's formally correct to do that, for me personally, 
Whenever I see a one-sided test, it raises red flags. It's kind of shady. It's usually admitting the data is not that clear. There may be cases where one-sided test is legit, but as a general rule for me, it's shady. In most hypothesis testing, there are three main methods that you commonly see, but it's worth reminding they're all formally identical. We can do some math to demonstrate that. Either I calculate x bar in its standard error and see if it's greater in absolute value than some critical value, such as 1.96 for a 5% level, or I calculate the confidence interval, <clears throat> which is 1.96 times the standard error, plus or minus, and see if that includes zero. Or I could calculate the p-value, which is the lowest possible probability that we reject the null hypothesis, and determine if that is less than my significance level of 5%. <clears throat> They're all getting to the same place. They're all doing the same thing, but it can be somewhat confusing because they all seem like they're very different approaches, but they're all getting the same outcome. Now, one of the places where ordinary people most commonly see confidence intervals is in polling. Support for some policy or some politician is given as a level with confidence interval, plus or minus two percentage points, maybe. Now we can figure out where they're getting that confidence interval from. It's actually easy, since the fraction of respondents who answer yes, call it P, is distributed binomial. binomial. So the standard error there is the square root of P times 1 minus P divided by N. Typically, P is going to be near 50% because most polls are looking for issues that are controversial with plenty of people on both sides. An interesting poll is going to have a probability close to 50%. That's also where the standard error has its maximum value. So if you want to be a little bit conservative, then standard error formula just set P equal to 0.5. Then the standard error is going to be pretty much determined by the sample size. A poll of 100 people would have standard error 0.5 divided by a square root of 100, so that's going to be 5%. If I poll 400 people, four times as many people, the square root of 4 is 2, so half the standard error. If I want a poll to have a confidence level of plus or minus 2%, then solve for n in that little formula there. It takes about 2,400 people. You can shave that down a bit, and I'm sure people do. If you're in the polling business, then you're Pricing is basically determined by how accurate the client wants the answer to be. Client wants a poll, then your basic question is, okay, how accurate do you need this to be? Do you want that plus or minus 2% or plus or minus 3% or plus or minus 1%? Then if it's plus or minus 2%, we have to find about 2,500 people to answer the poll. If the client would be plus or minus, would be happy with plus or minus 3%, then we could sample fewer people. If they want plus or minus 1%, then we're going to have to sample some more. Typically, the costs are going to scale with the number of people who are being polled, and that's the business model right there. Now, you should be able to work out this apparent puzzle, what I've called the devious poll. Overall, if I look at just the total sample, I can see the support in favor of some candidate is 170 people out of 300, and that's statistically different from zero at the, well, or 50% at the 5% level. But if I have three subgroups, maybe people in neighborhood A, neighborhood B, neighborhood C, none of the individual subgroups are statistically significant. Which is a reminder that statistical significance is very nonlinear. A p-value of 4.9% is called significant, but a p-value of 5.1% is called not significant. That can produce weird non-intuitive effects. Part of your stats education is drilling yourself to develop an intuition of how these things work and how some people might try to play you with that. Another sort of shady thing that people do is a series of tests. Every statistical test has some probability of error. Type 1 error often chosen to be 5%. That means if you do several tests in a row where the second test depends on the outcome of the first test, and the third test depends on the outcome of the second test, which depends on the outcome of the first test, et cetera, et cetera, then your error is going to compound. With two statistical tests, if each one has a 5% chance of a type 1 error, then the probability of not making a type 1 error in either one is 90.25%. So you're nearly doubling the actual type 1 error. 
the test significance is no longer 5%. If I do three tests and my significance is nearly 15%, I've almost tripled it. With 10 tests, the significance level is just 40%. This is bonkers. It's completely terrible. But the worst part is a lot of computer stats programs have automated routine that will test every group and subgroup to find a, quote, significant, unquote, difference. But that's no longer actually significant. That's not the advertised statistical power. Doing a series of different tests, so buyer beware. Sometimes people do this knowing that they're doing it wrong. Other times people do it and don't even realize the testing doesn't work the way they think it does or would like it to do. I'm kind of down on te can tests in general because I found for a lot of students, they're looking for a shortcut, but they don't get the understanding of what's actually going on. I'll sometimes ask a question on an exam where the differences mean is completely the opposite sign, what we'd expect. But, you know, students will just go through and plug in the test because that's what they've been doing. They're just plugging values into a formula without thinking. And the computer's even better than you or me at plug and chug. At no stage will the computer go, oh, Oh, that's kind of weird. R has plenty of CAN tests for t-tests and chi-squared and all the rest of them, but I'd be very cautious about using those tests too early in your journey. Shortcuts can end up taking longer. The final detail about doing hypothesis tests is with a small sample. Our test statistic for a mean is going to be x bar divided by s over the square root of n, where I'm estimating s. In a large sample, that estimate of s is going to be good enough. I don't have to worry about it. But in a small sample, I have to worry about that additional variation from that estimate as well. Now, perhaps you're asking, how small is small? You know, just like our previous questions, how big is big? But for this case, we have a simple answer, 30. Typically, about 30 observations is a small sample. That will give us sufficient degrees of freedom. If you're using small samples, then the test statistic has a t-distribution. You can see in the picture there, the t-distribution depends on degrees of freedom, and with fewer degrees of freedom, it has fatter tails. That changes the critical value. The normal distribution has a critical value of 1.96 to provide a 5% chance of a type 1 error. That's the bottom row of the table. As you read up that table in the first column, it's 1.96 at the bottom if it has a lot of observations. But if you go all the way to the top, you have five degrees of freedom, then the critical value would be 2.57. It's quite a bit bigger. Now for 30 degrees of freedom, then the critical value is two-ish. That's generally close enough. This is just something to be aware of when you have a very small sample.